Good morning everybody. Alright, so we're doing our part three of Justin Martyr's first apology. Now, um, in this part, he, he begins to uh, go through the uh, Hebrew prophets and explaining how they prophesied of Christ and how this proves that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he is the Messiah and that he is from other than this world. And uh, so it's going to get very interesting. I've It's been years since I've read Justin Martyr, and I've never actually gone in to look at all the scriptures that he quotes. And this particular uh, translation that we are reading they do give links here and they do give the scriptures so it makes it easy for us to just take a look at them and I thought it would be more fun if uh, we use some of the uh, ancient English translations of the Bible I have a few uh, at my fingertips here that we can take a look at and uh, I'll introduce them as we look at them um, so let's get started. Okay, this is where we left off in part two. Justin Martyr, First Apology, chapter 32. Now he's going to get into, uh, this is very interesting, because remember, this is early second century Christian who is in hiding, writing to the Romans, to stop persecuting Christians. He's writing a letter to the Senate. And now he's going to prove it. So it's interesting to see what Christians at that time were using as proof scriptures to prove Jesus. Very interesting. So let's take a look at this. Uh, start reading first. Okay, he says, Moses then, who was the first of the prophets, spoke in these very words and then he quotes from the book of Genesis so now Genesis is before Moses but as the uh, book of Exodus tells us that um, Moses was called by God to bring Israel out of the promised land and as a part of that bringing out God gave Moses the book of Genesis he dictated it to him as Israel's history and so Moses wrote the book of Genesis but he he wrote it as being directly dictated by God so you could say that the book of Genesis is the only book directly written by God and dictated Whereas the other books, um, that, like of the prophets, say Isaiah or Jeremiah, there are parts, and Ezekiel, there, there are parts in it that are directly dictated by God. Thus says the Lord. But then there's other parts that tell the story of the prophet, or, or the prophet will go and do a po poem, um, and like an inspired poem, but um, they're not necessarily the entire book being directly dictated. But the book of Genesis is. So that's what makes Genesis kind of special. Um, so what um, part now... I said I was going to use some of the older scriptures, older English translations to look at some of this stuff. So <clears throat> he says, when Moses, the first of the prophets, spoke these very words, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until he comes for whom it is reserved. So this is a, another translation, really. This is uh, Justin Martyr's translation. Well, he wrote in Greek, and he. this is a translation of his writing. And he likely was using the uh, Septuagint. Okay. And he shall be 
the desire of nations, binding his foal to the vine, washing his robe in the blood of the grape. And that's found in Genesis 49.10. This is from when uh, Jacob blessed his twelve sons just before he died, and he prophesied over each of his sons. And this is part of the prophecy over Judah. So it's saying that the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Well, let's take a look at it in the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible was written in 1560, and it was written during the uh, reign of Bloody Mary in England, who uh, went after the Protestants, and, and, and the Protestant teachers had to flee England to Geneva under the protection of John Calvin. And there they wrote the Geneva Bible, which is the, the first Bible to have chapter and verse divisions inserted into it. Now these chapter and verse divisions were, were already inserted into many of the uh, Greek um, philosophers' works, like uh, Plato and Socrates, and, and these kinds of writings had these verse and chapter divisions for scholars, but it was illegal to put it into the Word of God, because it was considered altering the Word of God. But the Reformers felt that because they're using the Bible as a sword, this, the Word of God is the sword, and they were often quoting scriptures and, and, and debating scriptures that it would be uh, quite handy to have scripture chapters and verses. So they inserted it. And every, every Bible since then has had it uh, inserted in the same places. Now these uh, scripture and verse divisions were actually put into the Textus Receptus by Eusebius, who made up the, uh, he, he gathered Greek, Greek scriptures which were carried into Europe by the people fleeing the uh, Islamic invasion and the fall of Constantinople. And these Greek scriptures Eusebius compared with the Latin Vulgate and, and found a lot of discrepancies. Um, and he kind of um, collated these Greek scriptures into one Greek manuscript, which he called, which is, became known as the Textus Receptus. Now that Greek manuscript, I think Eusebius put the chapter and verse divisions into it. And the uh, reformers who wrote the Geneva Bible were using that as uh, their main manuscript in translating, and they added these same uh, chapters and verses into it. And there's an old joke that uh, some sometimes it's crazy where the chapter starts. It starts in the middle of a story even, and they're saying that. Eusebius, while he was running to and fro on his horse and carriage, uh, make, writing his translations, sometimes he hit a bump, and that's where the chapter ended up being. <laughs> but anyway, so this is the Geneva Bible, and uh, the Geneva Bible, when they wrote it, they used to have in the side columns here all kinds of notes about what the text means. They put all these commentary notes from the Reformers, from John Knox, John Calvin. There, there's several. I think they even put some Martin Luther quotes and everything they had. And everything in this book was mainly to expose the Vatican as the, the harlot, the harlot riding the beast. And it was uh, the Vatican ruling over the kings of the Holy Roman Empire. And these guys were 
um, like a, an undercurrent uh, driving the reformation. And we have so much to owe these guys. Now what happened was <clears throat> the, the, the Geneva Bible was banned in 1611 by King James. This is the reason that the King James Version was made was that because the Geneva Bible was so popular everywhere, the reformers in 1611, King James was a Protestant, and um, they convinced him to make a, an, an official English version of the Bible um, mandated by the kingdom, King of England. And this was part of his reasoning for doing it, was to replace the Geneva Bible because these commentary notes also spoke against kings, and he banned it as a seditious book. Um, and then uh, they made, he, he gathered the teams of scholars from Cambridge and Oxford or whatever was at England, and uh, they uh, made the King James Version, and he approved it, and it was sent out to all the churches and the Geneva Bible was banned. However, the Geneva Bible was carried over by the pilgrims and by the Puritans into the New World in Massachusetts and, and uh, all through New England. Uh, people were using the Geneva Bible. And the Geneva Bible was very uh, instrumental in the rebellion against England um, because these people were studying the Geneva Bible and, and it was on par with the King James. And um, the George Washington was sworn in with his hand on the Geneva Bible and several presidents afterward used the Geneva Bible to be sworn in. So it has a quite a rich history. It was also called the Breaches Bible because in, uh, in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, God made them breaches <laughs> instead of loincloths. Yeah. So it's an interesting, uh, very interesting. If you get a copy, you can find a copy online too that has the commentary notes. And it's like very, very vicious uh, notes against the ruling class of the time. And this is uh, why uh, the reformers were like, I call it the Alex Jones Bible. They were like Alex Jones. But although their words were very vicious and often even over the top, um, they started the Reformation. They, they didn't actually start it. I, I guess Martin Luther is credited with starting it. But these guys, they fueled it big time. And and uh, this is sort of the the all the great reformers gathering together and making a translation and putting their their uh, opinions. <laughs> in the notes and the opinions of other reformers. So it's a great um, resource for getting a look into the mind of the reformers. So where were we now? Genesis 49.10. So let's take a look at it in the Geneva Bible. There it is. Genesis 49. 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And the people shall be gathered unto him. He shall bind his ass full unto Yevine, and his ass's colt unto the 
best vine. He shall wash his garment in wine and his cloak in the blood of grapes. So there's the quote. And this is a very good translation. Uh, see, it's talking about the scepter, the king's scepter shall not depart from Judah. So there will, the, the king of Israel will be from the tribe of Judah and the lawgiver until Shiloh comes. Shiloh means peace or rest. And the people shall be gathered to him. So this person's name is peace. That this person, Shiloh, will gather the people and will take the scepter of Judah, the king of the Jews. Interesting. Um, and King David was the, uh, the first great king of the Jews. So, let's go back to Justin. So it says, okay, it is yours to make accurate inquiry and ascertain up to whose time the Jews had a lawgiver and a king of their own. Up to the time of Jesus Christ who taught us and interpreted the prophecies which were not yet understood, they had a lawgiver and was foretold by the holy and divine spirit of prophecy through Moses that a ruler would not fail the Jews until he should come for whom the kingdom was reserved. For Judah was the forefather of the Jews, from whom also they had their name of Jews. And after he, the Christ, appeared, you began to rule the Jews and gain possession of all their territory. And the prophecy, he shall be the expectation of nations, Okay, so now uh, they didn't give a verse for this one. So anyway, so he's saying that the Roman Senate, the war of the Jews happened. And since Jesus Christ, the, the Roman Senate took over the land of the Jews and there is no more king of the Jews. And so that shortly after the, the life of Jesus and Jesus took the, the throne of the Jews, he took the crown from them. Shortly after that, the Herodian, the Herodian dynasty ended. So there's one proof. And now uh, when he talks about the prophecy, he shall be the expectation of nations. Okay, here's the King James Version now. This is the... Uh, 1769 version. Um, the King James, the first version came out in 1611. Okay, so Haggai chapter 2 verse 7. And I will shake all the nations, and the, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Uh, this house meaning the uh, temple. In Jerusalem. So this is the prophecy that he's alluding to here. And the prophecy, he shall be the expectation of nations, which we just read, signified that there would be some of all nations who should look for him to come again. So he would become the, the expectation or the desire of nations. And this indeed you can see for yourselves and be convinced of by fact. For all races of men, there are some who look for him who was crucified in Judea, and after whose crucifixion the land was straightway surrendered to you as a spoil of war. And the prophecy binding his foal to the vine, that's from Jacob again in Genesis 49, and washing his robe in the blood of the grape was a significant symbol of the things that were to happen to Christ and of what he was to do. For the foal of an ass stood bound to a vine at the entrance of the village, and he ordered his acquaintances to bring it to him then. And when it was brought, he mount, 
and sat upon it, and entered Jerusalem, where there was the vast temple of the Jews, which was afterwards destroyed by you. <clears throat> and that's, uh, he's talking about the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, riding upon an ass. Uh, you'll find that in the uh, Gospel of John. And I'm not sure, it's in other Gospels too. And after this was, he was crucified, that the rest of the prophecy might be fulfilled. For this washing his robe in the blood of the grape was predictive of the passion he was to endure, cleansing by his blood those who believe in him. For what is called by the divine spirit through the prophet his robe are those men who believe. So his robe are the believers in him whom abides the seed of God, the word. And what was spoken as the blood of the grape signifies that he who should appear would have blood, though not of the seed of man, but of the power of God. And the first power after God, the Father and Lord of all this world, who is also the Son, and of him we will, in what follows, re relate how he took flesh and became a man. For as man did not make the blood of the vine, but God, so it is hereby intimated that the blood should not be of human seed, but of divine power. And as we have said above, and Isaiah, another prophet, foretelling the same things, in other words, spoke thus, A star shall rise out of Jacob, and a flower shall spring from the root of Jesse, and his arm shall the nations trust. Isaiah 11.1 1. So let's take a look at uh, Isaiah 11.1. 1. Now this is the Wycliffe Bible. This is uh, the very first or oldest English translation. It was uh, made in 1395 by a man named John Wycliffe. And um, it's in Old English. Um, Wycliffe was burned at the stake eventually because he uh, spoke a lot about the Eucharist not being actual and it being only symbolic. And he uh, was criticizing the Roman Catholic Church on, on several points. Um, some Protestants will call John Wycliffe the morning star of the Reformation because it was a hundred years later that uh, Martin Luther stood up. And that's when the Reformation really took off. But Wycliffe is one of those small glimpses of, of the centers um, along the way during the darkest times of the uh, papal rule over the Word of God. <clears throat> so this is Wycliffe's translation. It's, it's quite interesting to read uh, the Old English. <clears throat> it says, And a yerd shall go out of the root of Jesse, and a flower shall sty of the root of it. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of strength, the Spirit of cunning and of pity. And the Spirit of the dread of the Lord shall fill him. He shall dem not by the seat of iron, neither shall Reprove by the hearing of Aries, by the hearing of ears, but shall them, okay, shall uh, judge, this is them, judge, but he shall judge in right, rightfulness poor men, and he shall reprove in equity for the mild men of earth.
very cool. Anyway, so um, this is Isaiah preaching, uh, prophesying of Christ. Okay, and then after that, <clears throat> and a star of light has arisen and a flower has sprung from the root of Jesse. So that's kind of difficult. Let's just switch to the King James quickly and see. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And the star of light has arisen, and a flower has sprung from the root of Jesse. That's from the family. Jesse was the father of David, the King David. So uh, from the family of King David, this Christ. For by the power of God, he was conceived by a virgin of the seed of Jacob, who was the father of Judah, who as we have shown, was the father of the Jews. And Jesse was his forefather, according to the oracle. And he was the son of Jacob and Judah, according to lineal descent. Okay, so Jesus was of the uh, lineage of the King David, is what he's showing here. And the manner of Christ's birth was predicted. Okay. And here again, how Isaiah, in express words, foretold that he should be born of a virgin. For he spoke thus, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and they shall say for his name, God with us. Isaiah 7.14 Now everybody knows this verse. We'll just move along. For things which were incredible and seemed impossible with men, these God predicted by the spirit of prophecy as about to come to pass in order that when they came to pass, there might be no unbelief but faith because of their prediction. But lest some, not understanding the prophecy now cited, should charge us with the very things we have been laying to the charge of the poets who say that Jupiter went into woman through lust. Let us try to explain the words. This then, behold, a virgin shall conceive, signifies that a virgin should conceive without intercourse. For if she had had intercourse with anyone whatever, she was no longer a virgin. But the power of God, having come upon the virgin, overshadow, overshadowed her and caused her, while yet a virgin, to conceive. And the angel of God, who was sent to the same virgin at that time, brought her good news, saying, Behold, you shall conceive of the Holy Ghost, and shall bear a son, and he shall be called Son of the Highest and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Luke one thirty two, Matthew one twenty one. And as they who have recorded all that concerns our Savior, Jesus Christ, have taught whom we believed, since by Isaiah also, whom we have now adduced, the spirit of prophecy declared that he should be born as we intimated before. It is wrong, therefore, to understand the spirit and the power of God as anything else than the word, who is also the firstborn of God, as the foresaid prophet Moses declared. <clears throat> and it was with this and it was this which, when it came upon the virgin and overshadowed her, caused her to conceive, not by intercourse, but by power. And the name Jesus in the Hebrew language means utnip, or that's a Greek word, means Savior, and it does 
Yeshua means uh, God saves. Yeh is the first two letters of the te tetragrammon. Y H Yeh Shua saves. Which means Savior in the Greek tongue. Wherefore, too, the angel said to the virgin, You shall call his name Yesu, for he shall save his people from their sins, and that the prophets are inspired by no other than the divine word, even you, as I fancy, will grant. So he's saying, okay, even you say the prophets are inspired by no other than the divine word. So, so he's saying, well, you should listen to the prophets. <clears throat> the place of Christ's birth was foretold. And here, what part of earth he was to be born in, as another prophet, Micah, foretold. He spoke thus, and you, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a governor who shall feed my people. Micah 5.2 Now, um, Justin Martyr didn't write in these, these uh, biblical verse indicators. These were added by the translator. But it's pretty convenient for us. So let's take a look at Micah 5.2 Oh, uh, let's try the Tyndale Bible. I don't know if it, some of these don't have the Old Testament. No, Tyndale doesn't have the Old Testament. Wycliffe does. Mike, Micah 5.2 And thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, Ephrata, art little in the thousands of Judah. He that is Lord governor in Israel shall go out of thee to me and the going out of him is from the beginning from days of everlastingness <laughs> whoa that's a look at that word eh <laughs> everlastingness okay now there is a village in the land of the Jews 35 stadia from Jerusalem in which Jesus Christ was born, as you can ascertain also from the registers of the taxing made under Cyrenius, your first procurator in Judea. Okay, so they've even looked it up. Now, Rome burned, remember, under, Neo, under Nero? Rome burned to the ground, so a lot of this was all lost. But Justin Martyr saying it's right in the tax registers of Cyrenius, <clears throat> other fulfilled prophecies, and how Christ, after he was born, was to escape the notice of other men and he, until he grew to man's estate, which also came to pass. Hear what was foretold regarding this. There are the following predictions. Unto us a child is born, and unto us a young man is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Isaiah 9, 6. Let's take a quick look at that. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us, this is the 1769 King James Bible. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on, on his shoulder, and his shame, name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This is significant of the power of the cross, for to it, when he was crucified, he applied his shoulders I shall be more clearly made out of the ensuing discourse. And again, the same prophet Isaiah, being inspired by the prophetic spirit, said, I have spread out my hands to a disobedient and gainsaying people, to those who walk in a way that is not good. They now ask of me judgment and dare to draw near to God. 
and he quotes Isaiah 65 2 and Isaiah 58 2. This was very common in those days, in the early Christian days, as they would just quote scripture out of memory. And you can find the scripture, but you, you'll find it even like two different scriptures added together. He's just saying, he said this, he said this. Um, that's all it is, and, and he did say it. Okay, so there's a, uh, I have spread out my hands to a disobedient and gainsaying people, those who walk in a way that is not uh, good. So that's in probably Isaiah 58. And then they ask of me judgment and dare to draw near to God. That's probably Isaiah 65 too. And again, in other words, through another prophet, he says, they pierced my hands and my feet and for my vesture they cast lots. And that is, um, oh yeah, that's in Psalm, Psalm 22. Um, they pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare at me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. And this is, uh, this is the psalm that Jesus was reciting as he died on the cross. See, it starts off, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So he wasn't um, saying, God, why have you forsaken me? He was reciting this psalm. So he knew this psalm before he went to the cross. So he says, um, and indeed, David, the king and prophet who uttered these things in the Psalms, suffered none of them. But Jesus Christ stretched forth his hands, being crucified by the Jews, speaking against him, and denying that he was the Christ. And as the prophet spoke, they tormented him and set him on the judgment seat, and said, Jush, judge us. And the expression, they pierced my hands and my feet, was used in reference to the nails of the cross, which were fixed in his hands and feet. And after he was crucified, they cast lots upon his vesture, and they that crucified him parted it among them. That's also recorded in the Gospels. And that these things did happen, you can ascertain from the Acts of Pontius Pilate. So there's more uh, Roman records he's referring to. And we will cite the prophetic utterances of another prophet, Zephaniah, to the effect that he, it was, he was foretold expressly as to sit upon the foal of an ass and to enter Jerusalem. The words are these, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, out, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king comes to you lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon the colt the foal of an ass. Zechariah 9.9 9. Let's see, what other Bible do we have that has Old Testament? I guess Wycliffe does, eh? Let's take a look in the Geneva Bible. Zechariah 9.9 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout for joy, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and saved himself, poor and riding upon an ass, and upon the colt the foal of an ass. And I will cut off the chariots of Ephraim and the horse of, from Jerusalem. The bow of the battle shall be broken, and he shall speak peace, peace to the heathen. And his dominion shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the end of the land. <clears throat> Interesting. So... 
different modes of prophecy. Okay, but when you hear the utterances of the prophets spoken as it were personally, you must not suppose that they are spoken by the inspired themselves, but by the divine word who moves them. For sometimes he declares things that are to come to pass in the manner of one who foretells the future. Sometimes he speaks as from the person of God, the Lord and Father of all, and sometimes as from the person of Christ. So this is regarding dividing the word of God aright. Sometimes as from the person of the people answering the Lord or his Father. Just as you can see even in your own writers, one man being the writer of the whole, but introducing the persons who converse. And this the Jews who possessed the books of the prophets did not understand, and therefore did not recognize Christ even when he came, but even hate us who say that he has come, and who prove that, as was predicted, he was crucified by them. Utterances of the Father. Oh, so now he goes into dividing the Word of God. Utterances of the Father, the Son, the Spirit. Okay. And this, too, that may be clear to you, there were spoken from the person of the Father through Isaiah the prophet the following words, The ox knows his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know, and my people has not understood. Woe, sinful nation, and a people full of sins, a wicked seed, children that are transgressors. You have forsaken the Lord. And again elsewhere, when the same prophet speaks in like manner from the person of the Father, What is the house that you will build for me, says the Lord? The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. That's Isaiah 66, 1. That that previous um, one is a collection of scriptures from Isaiah. And again, in another place, your new moons and your Sabbaths my soul hates, and the great day of feast and ceasing from labor I cannot away with. Nor if you come to be seen of me will I hear you, your hands are full of blood, And if you bring fine flour, incense, it is an abomination to me. This is also from Isaiah 66. The fat of lambs and bulls, and the blood of bulls I do not desire. For who has required this at your hands? But loose every bond of wickedness. Tear asunder the tight knots of violent contracts. Cover the houseless and naked, and deal your bread to the hungry. Isaiah 1, 14, 58, 6. What kinds of things are taught through the prophets from the person of God you can now perceive? Okay, utterances of the Son. And when the spirit of prophecy speaks from the person of Christ, the utterances are of this sort. I have spread out my hands to a disobedient and gainsaying people, to those who walk in a way that is not good. Isaiah 65, 2. And again, I gave my back to the scourges and my cheeks to the buffeting. I turned not away my face from the shame of spittings. And the Lord was my helper. Therefore I was not confounded, but I set my face firm as a rock, and I knew that I should not be ashamed, for he is near that justifies me. That's Isaiah 56. And again, when he says, They cast lots upon my vesture, and pierced my hands and my feet. That's Psalm 23. And I lay down and slept and rose again, because the Lord sustained me. And again, when he says, They spoke with their lips, They wagged the head, saying, Let him deliver himself. And that all these things happened to Christ at the hands of the Jews, you can ascertain, for he was crucified. They did shoot out the lip and wag their heads, saying, Let him who raised the dead save himself. That's in Matthew chapter 27. 
take a look at this in Tyndale. He, he has New Testament. Matthew 27, they that passed by reveled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple of God, and builds it in three days, save thyself. If thou be son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the priests mocking him, with the scribes and the elders said, He saves other himself, he cannot save. If he be king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. So the, you can see Tyndale's language is still pretty old. And that is uh, 1530. So that's like a hundred years before the King James. And see how they spell Jesus? Yesus. Yesus. King of the Jews. And then direct predictions by the Spirit. And when the Spirit of prophecy speaks as predicting things that are to come to pass, he speaks in this way. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Isaiah 2, 3. I don't think we need to look that one up. That's a very famous verse. That's even on the United Nations uh, mandate. Okay. And that it did so come to pass, we can convince you. For from Jerusalem there went out into the world men, twelve in number, and these illiterate, of no ability in speaking, but by the power of God they proclaimed to every race of men that they were sent by Christ to teach to all the word of God, and we who formerly used to murder one another do not only now refrain from making war upon our enemies, but also that we may not lie nor deceive our examiners. Willingly die confessing Christ, for that saying, the tongue has sworn, but the mind is unsworn, might be imitated by us in this manner. But if the soldiers enrolled by you, and who have taken the military oath, prefer their allegiance to their own life, and parents, and country, and all kindred, though you can offer them nothing incorruptible, it were very, verily ridiculous if we, who earnestly long for incorruption, should not endure all things, in order to obtain what we desire from him who is able to grant it. Christ's Advent foretold. And here how it was foretold concerning those who published his doctrine and proclaimed his appearance, the above-mentioned prophet and king, that would be David in the Psalms, right? Speaking thus by the spirit of prophecy, day unto day utter speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In the sun he set his tabernacle, and his he, as a bridegroom growing out of his chamber, shall rejoice as a giant to run his course. And we have thought it right and relevant to... No, I don't know where that is from. It sounds like it's from the Psalms. And we have thought it right and relevant to mention some other prophetic utterances of David besides these, from which you may learn how the spirit of prophecy exhorts men to live, and how he foretold the conspiracy 
which was formed against Christ by Herod the king of the Jews, and the Jews themselves, and Pilate, who was your governor among them, with his soldiers, and how he should be believed on by men of every race, and how God calls him his son, and has declared that he will subdue all his enemies under him, and how the devils, as much as they can, strive to escape the power of God, the Father and Lord of all, and the power of Christ himself, and how God calls all to repentance before the day of judgment comes. These were uttered thus, Blessed is the man who has not walked in the counsel of the ungodly. That's, I think this is Psalm 1 or 2. There it is, Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walked not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall also not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. The chaff is when you winnow wheat, you throw it up in the air, and the light uh, husk, the chaff, blows away in the wind, but the, the kernel of the wheat falls down from gravity. Uh, so that's like the chaff that blows away in the wind. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Blessed is the man who has not walked in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stood in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he will meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters, which shall give its fruit in its season. And his leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff, which the wind drives away from the face of the earth. Therefore the ungodly will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. perish. And then Psalm 2. Uh, this is Psalm 2 that he goes into. Why do the heathen rage, and the people imagine new things? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder, and cast their yoke from us. He that dwells in the heavens shall laugh at them, and the Lord shall have them in derision. He, then he shall speak to them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet I had been... Yet have I been set up by him a king in Zion, his holy hill, declaring the decree of the Lord. The Lord said to me, You are my son, this day I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I shall give you the heathen for your inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth as your possession. This is all Psalm 2. And you shall herd them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter, you shall dash them in pieces. Be wise now, therefore, O you kings. Be instructed, all you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Embrace instruction, lest at any time the Lord be angry and you perish from the right way, when his wrath has been suddenly kindled. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So that's exactly Psalm 2, if you read it. And uh, I think we'll just carry on until the last part here, prophecy using the past tense. And then, um, and then we'll see not fulfilled, not nullified by prophecy. We'll go into that in the next part, but we'll finish up to, up to the end of this. And again, in another prophecy, 
the spirit of prophecy through the same David, so this is another psalm, intimated that Christ, after he had been crucified, should reign, and spoke as follows. Sing to the Lord all the earth, by day by day declare his salvation, for great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, to be feared above all the gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols of devils, but God made the heavens. God and glory and praise are before his face, strength and glorying are the habitation of his holiness. Give glory to the Lord and the Father everlasting, receive grace and enter his presence, and worship in his holy courts. Let all the earth fear before his face. Let it be established and not shaken. Let them rejoice among the nations. The Lord has reigned from the tree. Now they don't give a thing for this. Um, there it is. For all the gods of the nations are idols. Okay. This is the interesting part. When he said they are all idols of devils. For all the gods of the nation are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Okay, so this is in the King James Version, uh, Tyndale. Oh, he didn't have an Old Testament. Wycliffe. For all the gods of the heathen, men be friends, but the Lord made Let's check the Geneva Bible. Psalm 96 5. Psalm 96 5. For the Lord is great and much to be prayed. No, for all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. So that's uh, idols of devils. So it looks like Justin added that in because that's what he believed um, from Enoch, right? Where does he say it? Ooh, there was a big car accident. <laughs> there's, a, there's a big uh, intersection right, right near me here and it sounds like uh, someone just finally got nailed. Okay, uh, sing to the Lord. So all the gods of the nations are idols of devils. So he added that in there. But, uh, you see, Justin is always pushing that point. Because in his time, that was the whole system of Rome, was through these idols. And he's always pushing the point that these idols are from devils. So that's why he added that idols of devils with confidence, you know. Okay, even though it's not actually in the psalm. Of devils is not in the psalm. Okay, and then the last part here. Prophecy using the past tense. But when the spirit of prophecy speaks of things that are about to come to pass, as if they had already taken place, <clears throat> as may be observed even in the passages already cited by me, that this circumstance may afford no excuse to readers for misinterpreting them, we will make even this also quite plain. The things which he absolutely knows will take place, he predicts as if already had taken place. Okay, so when a prophecy speaks in the past tense, it is absolutely going to take place. And that the utterances must be thus received, you will perceive, if you give your attention to them. The words cited above, David uttered, 1500 years before Christ became a man and was crucified, and no one of those who lived before him, nor yet of his contemporaries, 
afforded joy to the Gentiles by being crucified. But our Jesus Christ, being crucified and dead, rose again, and having ascended to heaven, reigned. And by those things which were published in his name among all nations by the apostles, there is joy afforded to those who expect the immortality promised by him. So there he is. He's saying that um, this 22nd Psalm is the most um, powerful prophecy of Jesus Christ. Hey, baby, did you hear the accident? Yeah, it's right there. Yeah. Yeah. Bad one. It sounds like a bad one. Exactly. I was traffic sort of where I could, you know, as far as I could see from the stairs. It seems like traffic was going, you know, like uh, on whose way? But I'm not sure about Salisbury. I don't hear any sirens. Not yet. Not yet. But... No, there will be. Yeah. From the, I, I've heard a lot of accidents and from the sound of that one. Uh, the, this place. That yeah. It's enough for yeah. people to at least get looked at. Yeah. That was on my video too. Was it? <laughs> yeah, the crash. Yeah. It sounds like crash. Yeah. Wow. I did see one vehicle. I was heading this way. Do a U-turn. Um. You know, as in. Oh, I yeah, because of the accident. Exactly. Yeah. I can't go through this place, so I better... Maybe we'll take a look. It's literally like one half a minute walk. Yes, I'm not yeah. <clears throat> Okay, where were we? So I guess we're going to end it here. Um, prophecy using the past tense. Okay, I went and took a look at the accident. Uh, there were no serious injuries. There were some people limping, and uh, there was a, like an SUV ambulance there already. Um, it, things happen quite often here I'm in the middle of the city. So, uh, what I saw was uh, it seemed this one car, a smaller SUV came and hit another car that was crossing in front of it, like T-boned, and knocked it right into where we usually stand when we push the button to cross the street. That The car was right in that spot, and there's a car lot on the corner, and it had hit a car on the lot, smashing the windshield on that car, and that lot is owned by my neighbor, so I went over to the neighbor and let him know that one of his cars was hit. So he got up to go over there too. Um, but it doesn't seem like any serious injuries happened, thank God. Um, but anyway, so that's the end of our video for today. We'll see you next week. We'll carry on with uh, Justin's First Apology, Part 4, next week. Uh, like, share, and subscribe if you enjoy the video. Let me know what you think of hearing these old English translations. I find them quite fascinating sometimes. Thank you very much.